But Matthias, I really appreciate you um, inviting me to have a chat this morning, this, um, this evening for you guys. Um, as you've said, and I think it's a good com comment you'll see in my notes here that um, really my interest is, is compounding uh, wisdom and wealth in that order. Um, I think that um, that's kind of how life works, um, frankly. Um, one comes before the other. Um, so I've put some of my notes together and um, based on the questions that Matthias has, has sent us. And, and so maybe I'll, I'll give you some of those answers and anyone just jump in at any point. So, you know, what's the story? Um, there is a story. Um, and basically that is I grew up in a house of eight boys. And I think that's really important. I'm the middle child of eight brothers. Um, what does that mean? That means you're very used to um, competing for resources um, and noisiness uh, and just a huge amount of busyness. Um, it also means that, you know, my mum was enormously capable um, and, and organised and driven. Um, and I think um, and my dad was terrific as a, as a provider for, for us as a family. Um, but primarily from the point of view that he always said that, you know, if you're doing the right things, things, things often work out, um, you know, in terms of growing up, I, I was the kid who came first in everything, which is important in terms of later story at 18, you know, my father's business in 1990 had been damaged by a CFO that embezzled some money. I was going to be a barrister. So that was my plan. Um, but I saw that, um, you know, my great interest was to, do law, be a barrister and go into business. Um, but as I, as I learned more, I realized that understanding, you know, the language of business accounting would be important. So I took an undergraduate cadetship. I was offered a cadetship by all of the big six at that point. And I went to Pricewaterhouse because it had the best training. Um, even at a young age, I just really valued learning. And it really is the thing that animates me as a person. It's the thing that I, that excites me the most. Um, I love great ideas and I, I, I believe genuinely it's, it's the great ideas that move things forward. And so in 1997, um, I'd spent nearly five years at Pricewaterhouse. I was offered a job at Schroeder's in their corporate advisory team. It was a leading independent advisory team in Sydney. And I lost that job. They said that I didn't fit in with other people. And I think that was true. I'd worked out I didn't want to be an advisor. I wanted to be a principal to my own transactions. And I'd gone there to get close to people that they advised. And, and that had helped me realize that I was more like that and less like that, which was a real turning point. Um, if you've sort of come first in everything and then somebody says, look, you're no good at this, you should do something else. Um, that gave me permission to step away and say, I've sort of done everyone else's boxes. I've ticked everyone else's boxes. And now I felt very free to do my own thing. At that time in 1997, I was reading this book called The Warren Buffett Way and one of the corporate advisors saw it. Um, I was younger than anyone in that group by more than 10 years. And one of the advisors said to me, I don't know why you waste your time reading books by people that just write books to make money. Um, and I said, oh, do you know who Warren Buffett is? And I'm here in Sydney, Australia. And she said, no. And I said, oh, well, you know, then I can't help you. Um, and, and so that was very influential at that point. Um, I went home that night. I said to my dad, look, I've lost my job. You know, what do I do? And he gave me two books. So he gave me Think and Grow Rich and um, How to Win Friends and Influence People. These changed my life entirely. Um, while I had done really well at university and in my CA program that I was completing, um, nobody had ever said to me, there'd never been one subject. There's not a subject to my knowledge in any university program in business in the whole world on how to work effectively with people. And that book's written, I think in the fifties and early on in that book, it says that if you can lead and manage people, then that's far more valuable and important than anything else. Um, that's certainly than any technical skill. And luckily I'd captained a lot of sporting teams. I played a lot of cricket. Um, and as it turned out, that was really where my abilities were. Um, for some strange reason, I've always been someone um, that that was able to get people together and move them forward and so basically from the the book think and grow rich it said meet people that have been successful at what they do and find out what made them successful so i took that literally i went back into morgan and banks i was given this corporate outplacement for six weeks i asked my corporate psychologist um 
he said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to stop. I'm going to reflect and write a book. And he thought I'd lost my mind, thought I was completely crazy. But I got a little book that was called The, ha the Who's Who of Australia. I got 80 prominent people that I just wanted to meet that I thought were interesting. At this point, I genuinely didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I wrote to him and I said, dear uh, Mr. Hawke, former prime minister, my name is Brett Kelly. I'm 22. I'm unemployed, but I'm keen to learn. If you'll spend an hour with me answering my 11 standard questions, I'll put it in a book. I'll get it out to other young people and, um, and they'll learn as well. And I wrote this first book called Collective Wisdom. Um, you'll note that I put it in, in inverted commas because I learned that while I was seeking wisdom, a lot of people that have achieved their goals aren't necessarily wise. And that's one of the reasons I, I guess I'll speak about why I love Warren Buffett so much. Not only has he achieved his goals, but he's sought to in, in, in increase his wisdom, which is, you know, deep understanding. And then I saw from that point, that book I self-published, I raised, I spent all of my, the money I'd saved since I was 18. It was about $50,000 um, in 1992 dollars uh, or $1997 um, since 93. And I put all of that into putting the book together. And I then went and I, I went to publishers and when I first went to them with the idea, they said, look, you know, you're not never going to get these people to talk to you. Like, who are you? And I said, yeah, you're probably right. But anyway, 12 weeks later, I had 32 of these people interviewed. I had over 800,000 words in two um, Lever Arch files typed up and transcribed. And I went back to the publishers and I said, you know, I've got the stuff now. Um, what do I do now? Um, I thought they were the experts, which was a good lesson. And they said, well, look, you're not Philip Adams or Ray Martin. So who would want to read your interviews? There's eight new books published every day. It's an extremely competitive industry. So, you know, we can't really help you. And three different publishers said that to me. I was reading uh, by a guy called Jack Canfield. Um, he'd written Chicken Soup for the Soul series in America. They sold 500 million books. And already I was looking offshore for somebody who was an expert. And this is a thing that I you'll see, I sort of always think is who's the best? How do I find out? How do I meet them? What can they tell me? And it doesn't matter how great they are. I just write them a letter normally and beg them to speak to me or, or track them down and get to them face to face somehow um, because I want to find out what they know, um, even if it's just getting near them so you can feel their energy and, and understand how they come at things. So this guy had done this 20 series um, cassette series. I still have it. And it showed you how to self-publish a book. So I literally sat down, I did his workbook, listened to the 20 cassettes. Um, and then I did exactly what he said. And as it turned out, I asked seven people for $3,000 each to fund the first 5,000 books printed. And then I printed the books, got an independent distributor, put them in the bookstores. And the book was a number one bestseller. Um, outsold Angela's Ashes in its first week. It was on national television and we got a huge amount of publicity. Off the back of that, I did more than 200 professional speaking engagements that were paid engagements and I was the youngest professional speaker in Australia. Um, the reason that that was so important was it gave me a whole skill set that chartered accountants aren't meant to have. It gave me a way to think about business. Guy, if you look Jack Canfield up, Chicken Soup for the Soul, these guys are serious people. They've, they are incredible entrepreneurs in a strange way and and certainly nobody in the accounting industry thinks that way. So I then I, I then go on this search for wisdom, I'll call it. I, I'm reading over 3,000 books over the subsequent X number of years, five years. And um, I build up this amazing library. And that's all I want to do. I go to work doing my chartered accounting. But um, in my spare time, all I do is I just walk around reading. And, you know, I read everything on Buffett at this point. I've stumbled on Charlie Munger. And he says, you know, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing Charlie Munger, but essentially he talks about his kids thinking that he's a book with legs. And I, I say to myself, the best way to be is to be like a person that walks around that's a book with legs, but a library um, with legs, um, a big library rather than a big screen TV. And so I see the Up series. It's the greatest um, uh, documentary series in history by sales produced by BBC. They follow seven kids every seven years for I think they're well past the age of 50 now. Um, and I think the gentleman that produced it's just died. And I said to myself, you know, what did I learn primarily from my first book, Collective Wisdom? I learned that most people live lives of quiet desperation. They mostly are completely unconscious to what they're doing. They're like animals that are stimulus response people. They just don't think before they act. They don't know what they're doing. They don't have a plan. And one day, they get to 50 and they get fired. Somebody takes their business card and they don't know what's happened. And I was in the corporate outplacement at 22 with those men 
and it was largely men in their 50s who somebody took their business card and then they didn't know who they were. And I said to myself, I'm never, ever, ever going to be that person because I considered that getting old and being more stupid at 55 than you were at 18 to be life's greatest you know, calamity. So I said to myself, I will stop every seven years what I'm doing. I will reflect and I'll write a book. And writing a book takes a lot of effort to write something down or to go out and do interviews. It, it really means you've got to pull out the car and stop and focus. And so four times now over the last 22 years, 25 years nearly, I've written these books. First one, Universal Wisdom. And that's where I stopped and said uh, seven, seven people that had changed the world. In that book, I wrote to Warren Buffett, asked him whether I could interview him. I'll show you the letter. He wrote back. And this is very, very important. In 2005, he just wrote back to me. And I thought, you know, if the basically my hero, the wealthiest guy in the world, he writes to me, writes back. I asked him to sign my copy of the Warren Buffett way. I sent him a return envelope. He signed it. He wrote me a letter and he sent it back. And I'm like, if that guy will speak to me, well, then I mustn't be, you know, such a bad person. I might have some potential. And so it gave me this quiet confidence to move forward and, um, and, you know, I am, I am by nature uh, a very, very, very persistent, determined person. Um, but, you know, you lose your job, you're not quite sure what's happening. And then you think, and people tell you you're different all the time. And then you think, well, maybe, maybe different is bad. Um, I'm not sure it takes time to sort of build the internal um, confidence. When I start the business, basically, um, I get married to Rebecca. She's there. And I'll talk later that, you know, you need somebody that's in your corner that inspires you and that you want to do great things for. And, and that's my wife and now our three kids. But my dad died in um, 2004. I got married to Beck in 2005 and we had Tom. And then um, I started our business in 2006. And I wrote that book, Your Money, Your Choice, in 2006 as the first act of starting the business. Um, that's incorrect on the top there. It says 11, but that's the reprint second edition. But in 2006, I start the, the business and I write this book. And it's about what should an accountant really do for their clients? I'd worked at Pricewaterhouse, three smaller firms. I saw that private accounting firms were disorganized, run by disorganized people without a clear plan. And that while they had a great um, mission to help people, they were so badly organized as businesses, they didn't even consider themselves businesses. So they were unlikely to be successful. And then... I'd read this Jim Collins book, Good to Great. I basically said every person that ever joins Kelly Partners has to re read that book. And if you don't read it in the first six months, you have to resign. Or if I find out, you get fired. And then I, and subsequently, I've written these two other books. But the way to think about, I guess, Matthias, my mindset and story is, you know, I believe the point in life, a point of life is to grow in wisdom, um, which is really defined as deep understanding. And you know, I did the Gallup. There's a really great um, personality type profile by the Gallup organization, the former polling organization that you, we use within the business. It talks about your strengths. My number one strength overwhelmingly is learning. Anyone that wants to learn anything I'm interested in and, 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 and kind of that's, that's sort of how we got there. So in terms of the big three life lessons, I'd learned through my first book that if you you know, I, I start reading these guys. I'm watching, um, um, I'm reading everything. I bought the full Simon & Schuster self-help catalog. It was over 2,000 cassettes. I put it on a bookcase and I just sat there listening to them, making notes. And there's this great old American speaker called Jim Rohn. And he says, don't, don't wish it was easier. I wish you were better. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that, right? So most people wander around blaming other people, blaming other things. And I said, no, 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 don't, don't wish you know, for things to be easier, you've got to get better. And so my mindset is that if anything happens, it's 100% my responsibility. And I, you know, I've, I've got to take responsibility, do something about it. And then Zig Ziglar, who's a great old American speaker, he said, you can get everything in life if you'll just help another enough other people get everything that they want. And so, you know, this is extremely influential in terms of my mindset. When we're looking to recruit people, I only have one question. Is this a person for others or is this a person for themselves? I can't help somebody that's selfish, self-centered, and they can't help me and they certainly won't help my clients. And the distinguishing feature about the culture of our business is this big idea, is this idea that you've got to find people that really genuinely want to help other people and genuinely believe that you win by making other people win. 
Now, if you help enough other people win, I've always been convinced that you'll win, but it takes us a level of confidence not to be trying to take, but in fact, to be trying to give. And then, you know, in terms of my own mindset, stick to your values, marry a person of integrity, um, understand that while time is limited and death is certain, so you should go as hard as you can, as fast as you can, you're, you've got to remember to be very, very long-term, which means generations. And in particular, that's your reputation. And then finally, it's all about the ability to work with people, which is not taught anywhere that I know. So these are kind of the scaffolding of the big ideas I think about around life. I believe that you bring yourself to a situation. And, and so you've got to know your ideas. You've got to know who you are. And, and when you turn up, people experience those those big ideas, those values, um, and ultimately your business will be a, a sort of outgrowth of that. So what does that look like, you know, for the economists and people that like spreadsheet amongst us or fin financiers? It means that if you start, um, I've read many, 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 many books, um, then I had this clear focus that chartered accounting is an amazing business that's often poorly done, that it's thought of as a craft, as a hobby, as a sort of micro thing, because the accountants are interested in the forms. They often forget about the people. And so I thought that there was a huge unaddressed market to run an accounting firm as a business in the SME sector. Why the SME sector? For anyone that's read anything that Warren Buffett ever said, the best income stream is one that lasts forever and grows it beyond, in, you know, beyond CPI. Well, <clears throat> people keep their accountants in the SME private business space for at least 30 years and often multiple generations. The oldest uh, firm we've bought is over 100 years old and the oldest client group we look after is over 80 years old. Now, the oldest firm in our industry, PricewaterhouseCoopers, it's the largest, oldest, 185 plus years old. I, don't, I know few other businesses where there are multiple organizations that are well over 150 years old. And so you've got a very long dated income stream potentially if you can do a great job and I know that families, private businesses that are run by families, their mindset is distinguished by a much more longer term, less transactional, more relationship driven view of the world than um, major corporations that are, are typically run by CEOs that somebody gave them the stock who are promoters, not, not, not founders. Um, and so this is what we've done. Basically, I put <coughs> $200,000 worth of my own fees into the business, borrowed $130,000 and I'll show you later, but I believe I've compounded my own capital at about 64% a year for um, 15 years. Um, and we feel like we've only got just got started. So this is recurring income in, an, in a growing industry where because of the leftist agenda and the lack of political will across both you know, the left and right in modern economies, no government in the UK, in Germany, in the US, in Australia, is going to deliver any hard news to its population. They're never going to stop spending. So they're going to do one thing. They're going to tax people with initiative more. And those people are going to need great accountants. Um, so this is a story of doubling. Um, basically, you know, 14 years of continual growth. I don't want anyone to look at our business and think that it was put together quickly because it, it just hasn't been. Um, it's been a very focused effort to, to build this thing over time. And basically, we've been able to double the business consistently, um, and we expect that that can continue. We expect that we should be able to compound the business, we say publicly at 10% a year, basically forever. Um, that doesn't excite a lot of people in this short-term world, but um, we, we think we can probably do a little bit better than that and for a long, long time, which is really exciting. Um, these are some of the highlights. They're just numbers, I guess. but. Basically, when you run a small public company in Australia, people say, can you just give it to me in 10 seconds, Brett? And so this is my KPG explained in 10 seconds. You can grow the revenue, maintain a great margin. 51% um, goes the parent um, entity. There's a terrific return on equity um, and, and, and invested capital, low gearing, a great return per share, which is a you know strong focus of ours. You can grow your operating cash flow and convert 100% of it virtually in real time. And your total shareholder returns likely to be very high and compound for a very long time. And then, you know, we're a certified B Corp as well, which is um, pretty funny because there's, I think, only one other listed company in Australia. We see that sort of ethical lens is likely to be, um, be influential. 
So, um, you know, there's a bit of a start, Matthias. I've got your other question. I can keep going until you get bored and and then just put your hand up and say enough. Um, my mate describes it as like drinking from a fire hose because I've been thinking about this for a while. I'll give you the mission. You know, why do we exist? I started the business and said any business that doesn't seek to really help people has no reason to exist. I use that word exists for a reason. Um, you know, in, in, in history, uh, Lucifer became the devil. And the reason he became the devil is he said, I will not serve. And so that is the most consequential statement in Western history in terms of major Western thought that drives our lives, whether we understand it or not. As soon as somebody says they won't serve other people, they basically are the devil and their business has no prospects of long-term success. And drug dealers rarely, you know, prosper for a long time, casinos and other challenged businesses that are genuinely about making other people better off are unlikely to exist for a long time. The longest existing organizations in the world are service organizations. Um, and that's a very, very key idea. So overwhelmingly, I said, our mission is to make private business owners, the people that we work with in communities, what we call better off. We do that through these big ideas, which is wanting the best for others, as opposed to being self-centered, doing what we say, which is, I think, the basic test of life, even if it costs you something. So living your values when it costs you something, if you've said you'll do it, you have to do it. And then working as a team, because teams can do a lot more um, than individuals. So these are the big ideas. This is how we recruit. This is how we do everything we do. If I tell you we're going to do something, it's basically a DNA commitment that that I just can't can't uh, break. It's a problem for me. And finally, in terms of vision, we just want to become the first choice um, financial advisors for private business owners in Sydney and Melbourne. And I started just focused on Sydney. We're ninety five percent revenue in Sydney. And a lot of people ask me why. You know why just Sydney. I think of great brands like Gucci and Hermes, um, Dior, um, those businesses in the retail space are out compounding anyone else. And when you see their brand, it will say um, Hermes Paris, no matter what city it's in in the world. And I took from that, and if you look at those behind those great brands, they won in one product. So they service, you know, they're a saddle maker or Coca-Cola, they had one product. And I believe that it, you've got to become great at one product in one place. And rather than impose yourself in other places, you have to have those other places want you to come there. So those great brands expanded as people visited in the Gucci in the 50s. They had the La Dolce Vita movie um, culture. The American stars went there. They found these handbags. And then when they went back to America, they were saying, how do we get that product? And so that, that company started to ship to the U.S., so really great businesses are grown by doing a great job and they're basically called into other markets rather than just prematurely imposing themselves, extending their supply lines and struggling to deliver at that level. So I really believe in internally building up the strength of the core and then, and then letting that go outwards rather than just a rush of opening offices everywhere that then don't build a strong customer following and, and, and don't have 185 years in them. So that's a very key idea, hence that geographic focus. I said, we've got to win in Sydney, follow the Walmart strategy. So Macca's front end system, Walmart back end system, Walmart go where other people won't go, go to the small places first, winning the small places become big before anyone notices. We're the 22nd largest firm in our, in our, in our industry in Australia. And we're essentially in one city, which makes us in one city, in one segment, private business owners, a very, very, strong business and in each of the ent areas that we're operating we're trying to become a top 100 firm by revenues build a big castle build out a big moat own a geographic area for private business owners now it is very countercultural because in our industry it's mostly run by men it's mostly phallic it's about size and i have this i'm national and bullshit bullshit um excuse the french um we're about depth and quality and we believe that long term that that will win so we, we didn't just go national. We believe that the head office of most major companies, um, certainly family businesses, is in one city. It's either Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane. The big ones are Sydney, Melbourne. Let's just, I grew up in Sydney. I know Sydney. Let's just own Sydney. And then the rest will take care of itself. 
at a great lunch about 10 years ago, I sat next to um, uh, George Roberts, who's one of the founders of KKR. And I said to him, George, how did you build this amazing business? Like, did you ever expect it to be the way it is? And he said, Brett, you know, I never thought we'd be in London. I never thought we'd be in Japan. I never thought we'd have the business we had. I just focused on doing deals really well, one at a time. And then all this, I just turned around and, you know, look what happened. And he said, well, what do you do? And I, I told him what we were doing. And he was like, Brett, there's so much opportunity in services. It's 65% of the Australian market. No one down here banks it. They all don't understand it. He said, you know, you're, 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 um, you're, onto, you're onto something amazing. Um, it was a little lunch for six people through YPO that one of my mates is a billionaire took me to. And again, I got near somebody who was smart who, who said, you know, I think what you're talking about makes sense. So we're, we're kind of, we believe you go fast by going slow, by being focused. Um, we go faster than most, um, but we're not in a rush. Uh, we don't, we want to do things properly. These are our shareholder principles at the KPG level. They're a straight, you know, I basically went to Buffett's principles when we started and I said, I, I want to build. If you look at our logo for KPGH, you'll notice that our font has always basically been the Berkshire Hathaway font. You'll notice if you look at our logo and then you look at LVMH's logo, it looks a lot like LVMH because my two great heroes in business are Warren Buffett and Bernard Arnault. I got to meet Bernard about three years ago in Paris, which is amazing. And why those guys? Well, um, there's this story that um, Steve Jobs said to Arnault, you know, my iPhone, I don't know who'll be using it in 20 years, but I know that everyone will be drinking your Dom Perignon in 200 years. So I believe the two best companies in the world are Berkshire and LVMH. Um, really what I'm trying to do with accounting firms is what LVMH does with luxury brands. They go in there, they take away all the things, centralize all the things that don't matter. And then they get the team to focus on rebuilding the story and, and building that local market and building out that brand um, uh, for that brand. So it's a hold co strategy. What are we buying? Private businesses. They happen to be accounting firms because that's where our circle of competence is. It's a very little circle, uh, but we think it's a big opportunity. So we don't really need to do anything else. I want to be as modern and smart as I know um, and as countercultural. You know, when he bought Dior, everyone thought, why is this guy buying a dress shop? That's weird. <laughs> um, you know, pretty, pretty inspiring guy. And so here's our mindset. Our mindset's partnership. We run partnerships. Um, you know, we want to do this partner owner driver mindset. Our guys are invested in their own capital. They're signing personal guarantees on the debt. They're extremely committed to their business. We pioneered this 5149 model, which is completely unique in the industry um, here in Australia and we believe globally and it's extremely well refined. Every business operates on the same agreements. I spent more than $3 million on those agreements over 15 years. And I think I know as much about accounting firms as certainly in this segment as, as anyone. And then our long-term goal is to maximize our intrinsic value. Now, right since I read Hagstrom's book, I've been using his two-stage dividend discount model. That's how I value everything. It's really simple. It works. I've made good money in the markets doing that. Um, but that's how I value our business. And right from the beginning, that was a very different way to look at the business. Um, we want to keep growing um, by continually acquiring, acquiring accounting firms and integrating them. I was inspired by Bank of America's acquisition program over a long time. Our system of acquisitions is completely documented. We have over 800 unique pages of documentation in the business that I've wrote, that I've written. I sit here and I just write systems and processes because that's what I love doing. And then I go and test them like a, like a weird scientist to see what works. And then we try and learn and learn and learn. Um, but that's definitely my mindset is really an academic style thinking. I always think that anything you say should be able to be footnoted. And most people in business just say what the last guy said. They, they can't footnote it to anything that approximates research or data. So I make decisions to, to maximize intrinsic value over time. We use debt prudently. We structure loans to be aggressively repaid, but we also structure them aggressively in terms of the terms of the bank and the safety of, of, of how we separate out all our SPVs. We measure our performance using EPS and owner earnings. We intend to sell them if ever issue shares to acquire a business. Down here, if you've got more, uh, less than 6 million net worth under our tax code, specific way it's defined, when we buy from a vendor, they get the proceeds tax-free because they're selling a small business. So I don't have to issue shares. If they want shares, I say, hey man, you should get shares. That'd be a good investment for you. 
So just call your broker, take some of the cash I give you and buy some shares on market. But I ain't giving out any shares. If I was to use any shares at all, it would be to attract more and more talented people. Um, but I don't believe in handouts because I think it's a wrong culture. And I never had um, anyone give me any handouts other than great ideas, which were free and um, effective. It's not our intention to sell a business that we've acquired. We want to be permanent holders. We think that very much distinguishes our mindset. Many people are starting one thing today, doing a different thing tomorrow. I'm trying to fix accounting firms and just keep them forever. And we'll be completely transparent. I'm a really direct sort of guy. Um, if you, you know, have a question, you call me and I'll tell you fairly directly, you know, what we're sort of thinking. So here's the investment thesis for all of you guys who are sort of thinking up the top, top right, there's basically a shrinking tax base in Western economies um, because of the aging of the population. And in particular in Europe, nobody knows how to have a child. Um, they consider that too much of a stress. And so with shrinking populations, um, you've got societal pressure to increase personal taxes because obviously anyone who works hard and gets ahead is bad, is, is evil. Um, there's this growing sort of socialism as a sort of infection around the world. And there's competitive pressure to reduce corporate taxes um, uh, across the world. So they're going to put more pressure on, you know, the big boys aren't going to want to pay tax, so they're going to put more pressure on, on privately held, locally domiciled businesses. There's increased tax, increasing tax complexity, compliance and collaboration across borders and digital, um, digital surveillance. And then heightened corporate disclosures and ongoing government budget deficits. So that's like the perfect storm that a private business owning taxpayer is going to be in the middle of. And so anyone under 50 who gets up every day and works is, is facing a situation where taxes will go up. Now, I've said this for years, but people think of, I'm odd. You know, I think Donald Trump was the first US president to, to materially cut taxes, corporate taxes in any advanced economy in 50 years. Um, and Joe Biden's come in and have you noticed his first proposal was to decrease taxes? Let's see if I can get a smirk. Um, the first thing he does is he wants to put taxes up. Um, why? Because obviously governments are tremendous at using that money you give them. Um, and so this is a big deal. Tax rates are going to go up and up and up. You hear all these crazies, particularly young people saying, oh, you've got to look to the Scandinavian countries. They've really got it sorted out. Partic maybe the Scandinavian countries have different demographics and a different type of population, a different situation. But I don't know anyone that wants to pay 50, 60, 70 percent personal income tax. But there's more and more young people who think that if you've got money, you stole it from someone rather than you got out of bed pretty early. And, to, and the reason I feel so strongly about that is, you know, when I started the business, I would get out of bed at three o'clock in the morning. I would get our little baby Thomas and give it to Beck to feed. And then I would have a shower, put my suit on and go to work. I'd be in the office by about 3.45 at the latest. I'd work until six, I'd go home, I'd have dinner and I'd start to get in my garage at seven and work till 11. And then I'd go to bed and I kept doing that. I'd do that six days a week, I don't work Sundays. And I didn't take a holiday for five years. Um, and, and, you know, I sold my bigger, bigger apartment and moved way out west and put my money into the business. Um, so all of those personal choices are really what drove the business's ability to grow. Um, but now today, most people think it's going to be some government choice that'll, that'll drive that. So um, this is the way we look at the market. This big bit in the middle, 60% of the total, 12.2 billion. Um, small private firms. Um, there's more than 10,000 of them. There's a huge, huge, huge opportunity. Um, 12 billion is plenty. Um, if you look at the margins and think about how little of that you need to get to build a significant business, um, there's a lot of opportunity. There's small I return, individual tax returns, and, and the tax office doing more of that. There's these, these um, national mid-tier, sort of second-tier firms that are running a 100-year-old model. And then there's the big boys who frankly, aren't really set up to compete in our market. So we think that there's, there's a huge, huge opportunity for somebody who conducts themselves professionally with a model that, that actually can work. I'll just draw your attention to this slide. I've just Brett, noticed Brett, that... can, can I, excuse me, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so looking at that slide before here, um, is there, do you think there is a reason 
why there aren't any large accounting firms uh, that are public other than the big four? Um, so the big four are not listed on, on stock exchanges. Um, and uh, if you were to say to me, I'm just going to look at my version of this year. I've got an even better version here. Um, um, if you were to say to me, Matthias, why aren't big four accounting firms listed? Has anyone ever thought of that? Guys, anyone got that question? A great the question is, is rather, why aren't there large um, listed companies in that field? Yeah, so this is a great question. The first reason, guys, is that the reason the big four aren't listed is because they could not do in public what they do in private. They've basically been multinational tax avoidance organisations for at least 50 years, and the world's catching up with them. So the internet is making the world trans more transparent. Governments are less inclined to put up with it. These businesses are, are having to move to consulting because their core business of effectively assisting in tax avoidance um, or certainly tax minimization, however you want to put it, um, is, is going to, to dramatically, that opportunity is dramatically reducing because the world will change rapidly from here with respect to how you tax multinational companies. So they can't be listed because you could not do publicly what they do privately. Imagine the CEO of PwC saying, look, we had a good quarter because, you know, Amazon got off a train in Luxembourg and we helped them stamp a, a little deal and we made an extra 100 mil out of that deal. You know, so earnings are up. They just couldn't talk about it. So they can't be listed. Um, the second tier are not organised enough to, to, um, to be public companies because their partnerships, which are really, they run what I call a co-op model where everyone milks their cows on their own farms. And then they have a sort of central place where they store the milk and, you know, they're just sharing a few resources. There's no actual business model there other than the old sort of barristers chambers mindset where you're an individual working on a common, you know, sharing rent. Um, and in the small private firm market, uh, Matthias, they're all just doing, they're like little versions of what's above them in the market. Um, nobody's actually looked at the market. And I, I, I think this is akin to the advertising world. You know, when Buffett invested, I think in 1974 or five in Ogilvy, um, um, I think he put 10 million bucks in, H&R um, uh, Block, I think similar in the US. Nobody thought that you could get to any scale in a professional services business, advertising being the, you know, the most well-known well um, uh, industry. I see our market as being similar to that today in that, um, in that, you know, could it be done? Yes. Would it take different thinking? Yes. You'd have to really approach it as a business. I was watching the founder of WPP the other day. I just watched a bunch of his um, videos, about 50 of them and a very interesting guy, different sort of guy, different take on things, not a, you know, an insider to the industry, but not captured by the zeitgeist, if you like, by the, you know, by saying you can't do this, you can't do that. Just came at the business differently. I think those businesses have been much more successful than people predicted. Um, I think our industry is in a similar position. All right. It's a great, great book I read many years ago, guys. It was written by Forbes, 32 billionaires. You know, what does it take to be a billionaire in your industry? You need to be an insider, but you've got to hate the status quo. And so most people, once they're insiders, they just fall in love with the industry. Rupert Murdoch being a great example. Rupert Murdoch is the ultimate newspaper man. He loves newspapers, loves newspapers. Um, he's an establishment insider, um, but didn't fall in love with the status quo and continue to disrupt and upend. And, and so dangerous in the industry because he's an insider that knows, you know, really knows the industry. So... I believe that combination of deeply knowing an industry, um, but not being captured by the industry um, is critical to being able to change an industry. And, and I believe that we can have over the next 50 years, significant impact in the industry, because I think as more people see what we're doing, um, they'll try and sort of understand it and think we're not so crazy. But, you know, there's been four failures as listed accounting firms in, in Australia, and they have mainly failed for two reasons. One, leadership, they've always been run by financial planners who tried to buy accounting firms to sell financial products to those clients. They're not accountants. Um, if you're not an accountant, trying to run an accounting firm is a bit of a weird thing to do. Um, and secondly, they've run a roll-up model where you just buy 100% of the business, roll it up, where you take on all the responsibilities, 
and leave the partners with all the rights. So that structure just doesn't work. So we, we've thought deeply about this. I'm working with an academic down here in Australia as well to do further research. He's done 20 years worth of research in this area, the only one I'm, I'm aware of in the world. And I'm doing further work with him to build out sort of his insights and, and support my ideas um, uh, you know, with, with what he's found over the last 20 years. So we think, you know, if we get this, if we get this partially right, um, we think we can get to significant scale of earnings, not of revenues, but of earnings. You know, a $100 million business with 40% EBITDA is going to do $40 million of EBITDA. That's a significant business. Um, and to get a hundred, you know, to get $120 million uh, of, of revenue, we're going to need to capture, um, say, 1% of the, um, the market. Um, we think that we are a good chance of of probably doing that, we may well do quite a lot better. Um, and I, I must say, I do look at the advertising space and think, well, it has been done. It's not the same um, uh, mindset, but here in Australia, Ausbrokers and Steadfast in the insurance insurance broking space are both billion dollar businesses and have both bought more than 60 odd insurance broking businesses on a 50-50. And you guys will be aware of Markel as well. And Markel's you know, got a similar type of mindset. So that, you know, Australia is very insular, looks only in Australia, there's not much here. Um, if you have a global mindset and you say, have private equity firms been able to line interests, have a 5149 structure and do well in services, businesses, people like Hellman and Fried, Friedman, et cetera, I think that there's enough support um, generally for, for that idea. What I do think is very, very different is chartered accounts are very stable people. They're highly intelligent, well-trained and stable people with a much higher average level of, of traditional ethical thinking than exists in most parts of the economy um, today because it's still trained um, you know, virtually the way they've been trained for 200 years and it does attract a certain sort of person. Um, so uh, I think that is, is very important to understand. And, and then just the general dynamics, you know, it's better to sail with the wind at your back. You know the government's gonna keep changing the laws. You just know they're gonna keep taxing. Now, Guys, have a look at this. I made our investment bankers. They didn't really do anything for the IPO, but what they did do is I made them make this graph on the left. I said to them, go and find out how many pages are in the tax act and tell me the compounding rate of the number of pages that have grown over the last 50 years. Now, basically, if you look at the compound compounding rate of the number of pages in the tax act, four volumes now, there are more lawyers in parliaments around the world today, in your country and mine, our parliaments have more lawyers as a proportion of the sitting members than they ever have had. Now, if you could imagine your parliament full of barbers, everyone would have much better haircuts, right? Um, but because it's full of lawyers, we're just going to have more and more and more useless laws. I read yesterday, Financial Times guys, um, PwC saying they're going to put on X thousands of people spend X hundreds of millions because they can see a compliance boom coming from all of this environmental and social impact style measuring, you know, triple bottom line really means triple as much compliance. Um, really, I'm good for quadruple bottom line because that'll send even more clients to us to help them. So we're societies that believe more and more, it seems, in putting more and more rules on people. And the people that, you know, effectively count those rules and enforce them are lawyers and accountants. So basically you're going to all these lawyers saying, what do you think we should have more of? And they say laws. So in Australia, it's an incredibly difficult, complex place to pay tax, even if you want to pay tax. And most people aren't that keen. So the opportunity, I really can't understate what I believe the fundamental dynamics are. Um, and part of the impact of those dynamics is that you don't need to be very good to do very well. And so if you're very committed to being very, very good, we think the market opportunity is just off the charts. We really do. We're very excited about what we see. So SME clients, long-term relationships. So we say that the, the big four, you know, they have short-term relationships with short tenured CEOs and CFOs. We have long-term relationships with people that actually own the businesses and are going to stay for a long time. And obviously in those retail businesses, you know, they, um, they just sort of, they have walk-ins that sort of walk in. We think by focusing in this tax and compliance space, everyone is saying, go into consulting, go into advisory. We know they're one-off non-recurring assignments. It's difficult to value an income stream that's one-off and non-recurring. It's easy to value a stable, um, highly recurring, um, above CPI growing um, income stream. So 
you know, I'll talk later about, you know, the best CEOs really come at life as an investor. They're investor CEOs. I'm looking for income streams that are highly recurring and going to grow beyond CPI for a long, long time. And so, you know, I can see that in, in, in this industry that is right within my circle of competence. I'm 46. I've been at this since I was 18. I've got 28 years experience. I've thought about these businesses, looked at them from the inside, the outside, upside down and inside out, and really look at outside the industry to be inspired by great companies. And I think that's a key, become a great company in an industry not committed to greatness in business at all. Um, this is how we think. This is what we do for chartered accountants. Um, I'll publish this later today, guys, and I'll leave you to think about it. But basically, um, when I meet chartered accountants, they have these specific problems. There's, they they have succession problems. 50% of the firms in our segment need a succession solution in the next five years. That means if there's more than, we think there's 12,000 firms in our target group, we're trying to sort it out at the moment, could be up to 20. We know more than half of them need a solution. That means when we meet a firm, if they're unreasonable, their terms are wrong, the values don't match, we don't care. We can just talk to, I can talk to five of these people a day. Um, there's an unlimited amount of them. Um, basically, um, attraction and team retention is their biggest issue. They don't have a brand or a position in the market that any young person aspires to work for. They're struggling with technological change. The clients are increasingly demanding. They've got an undifferentiated service offering. So I built a solution for that firm that deals with those issues. Um, basically, this is the issue that they have dealing with the client itself and we've productized a solution. So key to what we do is we have a productized solution for a client. It's all documented, it's all checklisted and it's rolled out the same in every office. How do you create value? This is my little progress pyramid that I've trademarked. It's, you know, I've only just started publishing it externally after 15 years. The business has a huge amount of know-how and trade secrets, but basically on the left-hand side, that's what a roll-up is. A bunch of those ones named at the bottom of, in my view, failures. Um, on the right-hand side of uh, businesses that have done well. I say there are 12 parts of a business. There might be others, but let's say there's 12 parts. Most people are focused on the, on the bit above that red dotted line, the operational bit. You need to be very strongly focused on that bottom core, right? Mission, why do you exist? What are your clear values? What are the behaviors you'll accept? What's a vision of winning? If you're winning, how do you know? What does it look like? What's your strategy? So your objective scope and advantage. For us, our objective is to grow from this to 80 mil, it's published. Our scope is in Sydney and Melbourne in private, you know, to four services to private business owners and our advantage is our system. And then our structure is unique. It's 5149, 10-year partnership agreements, et cetera, et cetera. And then across each of those lines, we've sort of, you know, built differentiation and built systems that support that and make it duplicatable. This is a structure you can read in your own time. We know that that's completely unique, invented by us and, and refined over 15 years. There's no one else in the world that's shown me anything that looks like that, um, let alone has the wherewithal to back up that they've done it many, many times and document it and, and have this thing actually operating. And that's really, to me, the core amazing uh, asset of the business is a un very unique um, uh, set of ideas and values animated by a clear strategy and locked down by a clear structure. A lot of businesses will talk to you about strategy. When you say, great, tell me about the unique structure that you've got that'll capture that strategy and get that rubber to meet the road, they don't have one. So we think structure is critically important um, and often overlooked. You do hear about, you know, guys like Munger say, follow the incentives and you'll know what's gonna happen. I, I'm interested that over time, they've spoken less about structure than, than I would have expected, but they've done more in terms of the structure of Berkshire and Markel and these great businesses. They've thought more about structure, I think, than, than virtually anyone else. So they understand that they're decentralized, that they're trying to empower people at local level, uh, you know, how, it, how incentives are aligned, et cetera, et cetera, where risk lies. This is our acquisition filter. I'll publish later, but you know, what are the values? No overload of over, overlap of offices. And I'm just sharing this stuff to say that none of this, I didn't write any of this for today, right? We did this last night, smacked it together, made sure that the uh, that the format was okay. These are long held and well-developed ideas. Hard to get in to the firm. It's no big problem though. I'm trying to get people not to join. Um, but I've got all sorts of little tests to make sure that the wrong people don't join because the worst thing that can happen is that we're going to waste time and I don't want to waste time. This is how we improve businesses. It's aligned to our pyramid I've shown you. Clear expertise, circle of competence, professionally and, and at KPG level, clear focus. We think focus, you know, when Bill Gates and Buffett were interviewed together and asked what is the one thing that makes the most difference in business, in unison they replied focus. So for us, if you see us change our focus, you should sell your shares. If you don't own any, you should probably buy some. 
um, system. It's an integrated system. It's fully um, uh, documented, systemized, based on an 80-20 idea that 80% of what we do for our clients, we should be able to systemize. 20% should be brilliance and then partner. Um, we have to be the best, best people at understanding how to do partnership in our industry. That's not a big challenge, guys, because you know most people are self-centered in the game, so partnership is pretty hard for them. These are some things that that we're really excited about. We've just been named. We think we're in the top 25 great places to work. It's only 140 of them in Australia. We're certainly in 140, and I think we're going to be announced in top 25, which is which is nice. Um, we're more internally driven than than externally award driven, but you know there it is. Um, we think the B Corp certification. You know the next thing that we plan to do in terms of developing. Um, the business in the consciousness of the market is to make sure people like Australian Ethical um, understand that we're that we are you know a great ethical investment for people um, that we're committed to being. It's pretty easy for us to commit to being carbon neutral because you know we're just a bunch of people, etc. Um, our NPS is better than I thought, and we're we're working on that at the moment with some great new software. Um, and then financial, you know, we're we're now the 839th largest listed company, which is helpful. Um, we think that as we get a little larger, we'll become a little bit more relevant. Um, we don't think that our, the, the, there's no question that the, the current price of the shares doesn't doesn't reflect intrinsic value on, on even the worst case scenario. And then we're the 23rd largest firm in the country, which is which we think is significant. We think that, you know, Buffett talks about scale as being very important. We do think that scale matters, um, but we don't, we think scale is different to size. Um, importantly, so scale in a focused market segment, um, running the same system. Uh, McDonald's wouldn't be the great business that it is if it bought KFC. It'd be larger, but it wouldn't be a better business in my view. Um, and then finally, you know, these are my two big things. You know, what's most important um, at a life level? Um, I, I went and found a quote that I that I read many years ago. Um, wisdom to me is the most important thing. Therefore, get wisdom. Um, the, to me, the, the real great crime against humanity is to be stupid, especially when you're in such privilege as we are. And then, from a business point of view, um, really, you know, my sense from a, 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 a an ideas point of view is that everything you do, try and think of it as being of permanent value, so that it can compound. So, if we can do something really well. We don't have to do it again. And then we have more time to allow it to compound. So I started in the beginning by saying I wanted to grow a hundred year business that lived well beyond me. And that was a great business, had the right, right values, the right behaviors and made a real difference to people. And so Buffett talks about if you can look out 20 years, you'll do better than the person who can. And I've taken that and said, well, if you can look out a hundred years, which in our industry you can, because we just know death and taxes aren't going away. Um, then I can say, right, how do we build a hundred year business? How do we do everything today that can be of permanent value? So what do we need to do to get right? We love this book. If you haven't read this book, go and read this book called The Founder's Mentality. It's written by Bain. It's an amazing book. Um, these are, if you know, uh, their research shows that um, in the US listed companies run by dominant founders have outperformed the market by nine times in the last 30 years. Most people are scared of businesses that have a dominant founder, but you know, your alternatives basically are listed sort of everyone in, head in the trough with no one actually driving the thing. They describe um, how do you stay an insurgent and get to scale? So don't become like the industry. And these are the, the sort of things they call a north wind, south winds and, and the things that you need to focus on. This is a great book. If you read that book, you'll sort of, sort of understand our mindset. This is the way we've always you know, run the businesses. We just believe in flywheels. We love Jim Collins. Um, we make everyone read this book. I, I, we acquired a firm that I met for the first time yesterday, 12 people, they got a backpack. And in that back, backpack were three books, good to great raving fans and my book, Your Money, Your Choice, had their contract, a mug and a cap. Um, but this book, I say to people, read the introduction, read the chapter summaries. If you haven't read this book, by the end of your six month probation period and I find out I'm going to fire you for sure or I'm going to find out why, why you haven't read it. And if you haven't read it and you won't read it, if you don't want to be a learning person, you can't be in the organization. This is what we're focused on. Um, and it goes to permanent value. Um, we believe determined leadership, focusing on the right people, people that are people for others, confronting the brutal facts. We are pretty brutal. Um, we're pretty direct. Clear hedgehog. So we want to be 
the best in the world at advising private business owners. We've got a clear economic model and we're very passionate about it. We think that's that's easy. It's not going to change. We, we are extremely disciplined as an organization. If you look at the management of our work in progress, our debtors, it's, it's as good as it is for any firm of any scale anywhere in the world that I've seen. And then we just use technology to, to accelerate the flywheel. We don't think about technology as, as being some sort of silver bullet. Guys, if you haven't read William Thorndike's book, The Outsiders, we love this book. Um, and, uh, you know, we keep reporting against this framework because we just believe it makes sense. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know very much, but I'm good at learning. And so I find people that know a lot and I just take exactly what they teach me and I do exactly what they teach me. The guy in there that I like the most is John Malone. Uh, what we're trying to do is get a big number of, of clients and keep servicing those clients. And John Malone took his big number of clients and found interesting things to do with those clients. We see some amazing things we can do with our, our client community if we can grow it large and deep over time in, in a similar way that, that he did. Uh, most difficult challenge. Um, uh, you know, that was a great question, Matthias, that you flicked me on, you know, what's been the most difficult challenge? The most difficult challenge is, is always, I believe, self-belief of the founder to keep going, to stick to your knitting. When we listed the business in June 17, um, I just had all of these sort of analysts and people who are, apparently are investors, but have, but have never read anything. I would say to them, have you read Snowball? No. Outsiders? No. King of Capital? No. Uh, Warren Buffett way? No. Ground Rules? No. Um, have you read Quality Shareholders by Cunningham? No. Do you, they don't, they don't read anything, but they're investors. So I didn't have any particular pathos with these types of people. And I really had to just go, you know, internal to the business and just focus on the business. Now I was able to do this because I had my letter from Warren Buffett framed in my office. Um, I, I um, keep reading great books. So I feel like I'm surrounded by these amazing people over there in my office. I've got, you know, four really great books there um, that really inspire me that I have up facing me that I built this special stand for. I've got, um, I've got this guy, I have to show him to you. Um, so this guy lives in my office. Um, they moved him the other day. Uh, these are our 15 year balloons that somebody put in my office and they moved my friend. So we just improved him. Um, and so, as weird as it seems, um, Buffett says you have to keep great company. So I bought the cardboard cutout of Warren Buffett and I keep him in my office so that if somebody silly comes in and says something stupid, I just turn to my friend and he encourages me. Um, and then I don't have to think about the ridiculous things that people say to me. Um, they tell me accounting's not a, not a business. You know, this can't succeed. Why don't you stop paying dividends? The next guy says, why don't you start paying dividends? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? And I would be listening to these investors and I'd write down all their notes. And at the end of meeting 10 of them, I, I wouldn't be able to run the company because every single one of them said something diametrically different to the one I met before. And so um, recently I just thought, you know what, I'm going to take back the company. It's old. It's nearly five years now. I think we're showing in public what we've been doing in private. I'm going to write my quality shareholders newsletters. I'm going to run my my shareholders AGM and I'm going to um, get out there and just be who we are. And so uh, these quotes from Buffett, you know, surround yourself with people who are better than you. If you can't meet them, um, just, um, just, um, just buy a cardboard cutout and get all their books and put them around you. I keep all my, like my great friends here. So I have um, Steve Schwartzman. This is a great book, King of Capital. And I have the outsiders. And I have um, Lawrence Cunningham. This is an awesome book that is very much what we're doing. Dando Investor, Monash Pabrai. Um, invested with Daniel Town, Founders Mentality, Guy Spear, Bern Harnish. These are all the people I just keep next to me. And so they're like my protection from bad ideas, like bad people with bad ideas. And mostly those bad ideas are short-term ideas. Recently, um, when I put my quality shareholder thing out, somebody sent it to Lawrence Cunningham. Lawrence sent me an email on a Saturday morning. I was in the I was in a butcher buying some meat for a barbecue, and I get this this email, and I thought, "Hang on, I thought somebody was writing to me about him, but it was actually him." And I was like, "That's incredible." He said, "I read your quality shareholders newsletter. That looks a lot like my book." I'm like, "Yeah, that's where I got all my ideas from. Your book." Um, 
And like a good student, he's a professor. I just took exactly what he said, and that's what we do. Um, we reformatted our website and made sure everything was clear in his format. Um, and so we had a couple of Zooms with him, which has been amazing. But this is a continual story. If you look at my wisdom books, and if you look at, um, at, at interaction with Lawrence and many other people, for years, I've just gone out there and tried to find the best people and keep them around me. And then I keep everyone else sort of outside my, I just stay away, I hide so that their bad ideas um, don't infect me. Um, in terms of culture, just very last, this is a team-based organization, um, clear values, I just cannot, if you have an overriding mission with clear values and you recruit against those values, which we do, and then we align people, I say to everyone, everyone's got a career development folder, every one of our team leaders has to do a one-on-one -on -one meeting every month for 20 minutes with every one of their team members. Um, that is the overwhelming number one requirement of any of our partners. If you don't want to lead your people, you don't want to understand what their personal goals are and how they align with the business, then I don't want you in our business. We have a reading list. A lot of people say, I want to build a culture, but no one has a reading list. If you don't have a reading list, you can't have a culture. You see, you can't be Italian if you don't speak Italian. So you have to have your own language. And right from day one, I wrote this reading list because two of my people came to me, my two, two of my founding employees, and they came to me and said, Brett, how do you know all these things? I said, I read all these books. They say, can you tell me the books that we should read so we know some of the things that you know? I said, yeah, absolutely. So I wrote this list. They read them within three months. And that built this culture that if you don't read these books, you have to get out of our organization. If you don't want to be a learner, you can't be an earner. So pff, this is a learning business. But this is overwhelmingly, if you start a business and you don't start a reading list, you can't talk to me about culture because culture is an outcome. You get culture. A lot of people talk about it. You get a culture from high performance, operational high performance gives you a culture. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to build a language. You need to build systems and processes that make things happen, that make people better off. If you meet with your people one-on-one -on -one every month and you ask them their goals, you explain the business's goals, you tell them how they're aligned, you look at their performance, make sure they're getting the right experience There's seven parts of this folder, then you've, you've got a chance that they will believe that you really want to make them better off. And if you make somebody better off, they do a lot more for you than they'll do for anyone else, given the ideas that they need. Here now, we've got every one of our people is an owner. We're using this technology called Upstreet that's Australian based. When you get, when it's your birthday, we give you a birthday present. The only presents that we now give to people are Kelly Partners shares. They're not issued, like we're not issuing more shares. The businesses, instead of buying you a birthday cake, give you $20 worth of shares. They go through this, this um, app and it pops up on your phone, little boom. So you get a Christmas present, an Easter present, your birthday present, something for your annual um, work anniversary. If you're a crew to staff member, we give you $5,000. It goes, it will go in this app. If you bring a new client on, we'll give you 10% of the first year's billing. It'll go in this app. We're extremely excited about this. We just launched it for our 15th anniversary. A lot of businesses are using this um, to do, uh, if, you buy if you buy from them, they'll give you fractional shares and we've reversed that. But we think in the future, We'll be able to incentivize our clients for doing business with us. We'll be able to give them a like a trailing commission if they send us new clients, but we'll give it to them in KPG shares to build further alignment. Guys, we do a huge amount in the communities, right? In every business, we strongly support the communities that are local to our businesses. We think that's just um, the, you know, the right thing to do. And we believe by doing the right thing by people, our people will do the right thing by us. Very quickly, 15 years, we're just getting started. Um, I've got a little slide here, the ground rules. If you haven't read this, read this. Buffett talked about right from the beginning, don't measure me in five minutes, measure me in five years. We'll be five years um, listed in June. Um, it's coming together nicely. I always said that when we listed, it would take five years to convince anyone that we, we had any idea about what we were doing. Um, I, I'm expecting to do this till I'm 90 at least. Buffett's 90 currently. Um, I think we can do it for a long time. So, you know, that's our mindset. We published a five-year plan. We won't publish another one. I just published it about 18 months ago because the market down here is so short term and myopic. I felt like I needed to, you know, it was sort of throwing a bit of popcorn at moviegoers so that they thought we actually had a plan. If anyone's ever met me, um, they'll, they'll work out pretty quickly. I've got a pretty clear plan that we're not mucking around, uh, but I had to um, show the market something. This accelerate phase that we're in is going very well. We've done over 7 million of acquisitions this year. We've got a massive pipeline and a huge amount of opportunity. So we think you can see here, we don't need to do very much to sort of get to our target number. Our target number that we've published is 80 million. 80 million gives us a 
20 to 24 million of earnings. We own half of that. It'll get us to eight to 10 million of NPAT. That sort of gets us to, I sort of think about like climbing Mount Everest. It gets us to the next base camp where we can say, okay, can you see what we're doing? The market is seeing it. So we're getting more firms coming to us. The market is seeing it. So we're getting more talent come to us. We are building a flywheel. And that's why we are publicly listed so that I could do in public what we do in private. And the more people see it, um, the more they're attracted to it. It's a very clear model. You can read that in your own time. It's really simple. That's what's beautiful about it. We don't have to actually do anything interesting. We run the existing business, a little bit of 5% organic growth, tuck some, make some acquisitions that are tuck-ins, make some acquisitions that are marquee, maybe start the odd greenfield, do a few other services and the business becomes quite large. Um, but we did that. We stepped that out so people could understand. Um, basically, a dollar invested IPO is compounded at 33% per annum. Um, a lot of people are surprised by that, but this is how I expected it to work. I thought it would take a while. People would sort of click and understand what we're doing. We still think there's a significant gap to intrinsic value. Not that we care. We're not running the business for the share price, um, but it doesn't hurt that the share price actually reflects um, closer to, you know, sort of the reality of the business. We're paying monthly dividends because we have a dividend imputation system down here. And I basically wanted to show that we could because there's so many, I think, shitty fraudulent listed companies um, that are talking about adjusted EBITDA and adjusted, you know, triple adjusted and quadruple adjusted terms that none of us understand. I, I want it to be an NPAT organization that paid a return to shareholders. I call it putting pain on suffering on your competitors. Um, I, I just want to show them the money. And then young accounts who are stuck in shitty firms are like, well, how come they can do that? Like, what are we doing? Um, these are some um, global comps. Um, we don't think they're directly comparable. We don't think Talonom's model's anywhere near as good as ours. They're just selling a bit of sex to the market. They, they talk about software. There's a company in Australia called Xero, X-E-R-O. It's like a $20 billion company. If they ever go anywhere near Talonom, they'd squash them, obviously. But, um, you know, obviously, um, everyone's pretty excited about that business. We don't think their fundamentals are better than ours. Focus Financial Partners are a massive listed um, US group trading on 100 times nothing, um, which is interesting with a billion you know, well, $2.3 billion worth of debt or something thereabouts. If you look at our debt to equity and our ability to not issue shares and continually grow, um, over time, we think we're a better compounding machine with a better model by far. Um, but, you know, look at the incentives. The people in those businesses have never had a significant amount of their own net worth at risk um, in their core activity. Um, what The reason I share that is, I think we can grow to a relevant market cap. And as we grow in Australia to a higher market cap, we'll end up in the top you know, 500, 300, da, da, da. It'll put us into some indices. So there's more automatic growth as people have to start to buy the stock. We think there's still a lot of run um, in the business. Fundamentally, um, I, I will do with your money as an investor what I do with my own. I still own over 50% of the listed company. And I do know how to compound my capital and I'll compound yours as a partner, as I have for my other partners. There are 54 partners in the business. We have external shareholders. I've had external shareholders since 2008. Yeah, since 2008. Those, in, in, those uh, internal shareholders, when I needed to raise 800,000, I think on today's number, they came in at about eight or 10 cents. So they've done okay. Um, basically, I've compounded my own capital at 62% a year for 15 years. I think that's a pretty good um, situation. I've taken little to no risk to do it, stayed within my circle of competence. And I think we've shown we've got a pretty duplicatable solid uh, model. Um, I get asked often, well, how do you come to these conclusions? How do you value the business? I point people to that book and go, you go to the appendices and see if you can copy that model. You just make whatever assumptions you like. And I think the business looks okay. We don't put any assumptions to the market, but we think the business can run for a long time and grow, you know, grow okay. And and uh, that'll turn out turn out pretty well. And then we, we're trying to publish clear owner earnings so that people can see um, that we've continually grown our owner earnings over time, um, but we're not in a rush. So guys, here's my disclaimer. Anything I said today, you know, it's not recommend, it's not a uh, investment recommendation, et cetera, et cetera. And um, Matthias, I've probably used all your time, but if anyone's got any questions, um, I'm here for you. Excellent. Well, Brett, thank you so much. You made my job really, really easy. Um, because all the slides basically uh, and what you said caught exactly what I wanted to ask you or what I was tempted to ask you. So uh, great job. Thank, thank you so much. Um, thank you for I, sending such good questions, Matthias. They're very thoughtful questions. Th thank you. Well, 
Um, I have a few here that were sent to me via the uh, chat board. So one, one is a good one. So the one is from, from Jerry. He said, you clearly work extremely hard, which I think is evident to everybody listening and, and, and watching you. Um, what do you do in your spare time to relax and freshen the mind? Any tips or hacks, exercise, meditating, anything you can share with us? I remember okay. you, you spoke about so many books, right? But you, last yeah. time we spoke, you also mentioned you have a spe special technique or actually you read a book about how to read a book. Um, that might yeah, also be so, interesting. Okay, so guys, the key is, um, and I teach this to our clients, I'm extremely organized. So this is my year. And you'll notice all the yellows, the holidays. So what I do every year in December, beginning of December, I plan the next year. I book out all of my holidays. For the last decade, I've had 16 weeks holidays every year. Um, so that's all of the kids' school holidays. But you could probably understand that when I'm on holidays, I'm good at being focused. So if I'm with the kids, I'm with the kids. Um, but if I go to the bathroom, I probably look at my phone and you know answer my emails and things because I really like what I'm doing. Uh, but I thought that it was very important to spend time with the kids. My kids are 16, 13, and nine. Um, so that's the first thing, be overwhelmingly organized. I carry these little cards around. Um, on the back has got the capital allocation framework. And on the front has got my goals. And I do them every quarter. And I stick them in my wallet. And I stick them on the driving, on my wheel of my car. Um, I put them all over the place. So I have them with me. Um, so that if in your brain, you can be just very organized, it's easy to be focused. Um, and then I don't work Sundays ever, unless it's an extreme emergency. Um, I, I would tell you that I think that that for any high performing individual or team is absolutely critical in accounting more than 50% of people experience a mental health episode in their career is the statistics. And I believe they experience that because they never stop working. And so not not from any religious point of view but you know all of the religions have some wisdom in them um and one of those is don't work on sundays or if you're jewish don't work on saturdays or if you're something else don't work on fridays but choose a day where you will absolutely not work because that will keep you fresh and um give you give yourself time to to um to sort of realign um in your brain as well as physically I, I have a trainer, um, Matthias. I work out every Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at lunchtime. Um, I play a lot of sports, so I like to keep fit. Um, and if you book a meeting over my um, gym, I just won't come. It doesn't matter who you are, right? So if you're the Queen of England, I'll probably make an exception, but otherwise, um, probably not. So it's absolutely critical to me to exercise. I know that, um, that that's to me really important. Um, I believe in, you know, meditation because a lot of people don't believe in prayer. Um, and so today, you know, if you think as a modernist, all people are doing is trying to replace ancient ideas. So once upon a time, you know, every ancient text would say, find a solitary place with no technology and, and don't let anything get at you for 10 minutes. And they used to call that prayer or that you'd go to the desert or blah, blah, blah. Today, I have all these trendy CEOs. They say to me, I meditate. I said, well, that's great for you, mate. Um, find a local church. Most of them are empty or a mosque or a synagogue or whatever. They're great buildings, very thick, very quiet and very empty. Um, nobody can get at you there if you'll turn your phone off. Um, I think that it's a big mistake to throw out all ancient ideas and try and reinvent them um, just in your own lifetime because we don't have very long. Um, so we should learn from other people's wisdom. And to me, overwhelmingly getting quiet time um, away from the hustle and bustle um, of, of life is really important. I don't experience my work as hard work um, at all. Um, I, I literally jump out of bed. I absolutely love what I'm doing because I love people and I like to help them. I like to see them thrive. I get a huge amount of energy from that. And I think critically understanding what are the things that give you energy and what are the things that take energy and getting away from the things that try to take your energy? You know who those people are. You know what those situations are. You know, I see my mum once a year um, or any time that she's feeling positive. Um, and, and I see anyone else in the same way. You know, some of my siblings, I have seven siblings. One's now dead. I have six. I see some of them more regularly than others. They would be the more positive versions. Um, and it's the same with my friends. I'm absolutely 
absolutely brutal about curating the people that I've let near me because of their negative input. You know, a lot of people have got chips on their shoulders. They're down and out about life and other people and everyone else is, is the reason that, that they're not doing whatever they think they should be doing. Um, I think we live in incredibly privileged times in, in the West, you know, of, of a huge amount of prosperity, a huge amount of freedom, a huge amount of safety. And so, um, and no matter whether you're tall or small or short or whatever ethnicity, you got more opportunity in these economies than anyone ever has in any of human history. And so, you know, to me, um, I'm trying to keep, keep that in mind um, while also acknowledging the challenges that exist around the world. Um, I'm trying to stay upbeat and, 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 and manage what goes into my, into my, my, my soul, if you like. Excellent. Um, I saw your little um, card with um, uh, William Thorndike's, I don't know if it's from him, but this three yeah, sources of capital that's and it. five yeah. ways to deploy it, right? That's the one, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, that's How do you it. think about your business in terms of that framework? Yeah, so it's an ultimate cash flow machine. So we know that um, we don't, we, we don't, you know, we, we would issue a bond. We're looking actually in Europe, if we could, if we could raise a $50 million bond at one and a half percent for 10 years that had no recourse to the whole co and no cross collateralization, uh, we would raise, you know, we would issue that type of debt. Um, uh, but you know, we're still struggling. I think we're talking to some people in Dusseldorf, so we're keen. We'll throw that out there. If anyone knows how to do that, we're keen. Um, uh, we won't issue equity. Um, so as a general statement, overwhelmingly the case, you know, if you want to, if you want me to issue equity, the share price would need to be dramatically overvalued. Um, I'd tell you that too. Um, you'll know that because you'll see me issue equity. Um, uh, and then we will reinvest in our businesses to keep them competitive. But we also know that if you allow poor people to manage your money, they'll manage it as poorly as they manage their money. Now, most people are poor because they manage their money poorly. So, and that extends to our business partners, employees, et cetera. So we take the cash out of our businesses every Monday, direct debits. We set up separate bank accounts. This is operating, this is tax. This is part of profits. You cannot touch that money. You cannot touch that money. And we just keep taking money from the businesses and moving it because otherwise the partners who, who are developing their, their ability to work with money might just find a way to spend it. And so um, that's an overwhelming sort of concept. Then we're looking at a whole co-level saying, well, what's the best way to allocate this? By keeping the businesses lean, it forces the businesses to actually think about how to deploy their capital intelligently to grow the businesses, build the equity in each SPV so it can make acquisitions. What I'm worried about as a whole co, and this is, you know, Buffett doesn't pay dividends because there's no franking system in, in the US, in my view. Um, that's an overwhelming reason, the tax inefficiency of it. But he, he sucks up all his capital. Just with our group, if I, if I kept too much capital in the whole co, it would potentially breed a culture where your subsidiaries believe that if they mismanage their situations, you would bail them out. And I've run a very hard line about, we will never bail you out. And if we do, we'll bail you out the way the public markets would bail us out. So last year, when the pandemic started, our share price fell to 60 cents. And it was the first time I'd had consistent contact from our lead you know, um, broker since the IPO. They were like, hey, Brett, how are things going? Do you need us to raise some capital for you? And I'm like, not at 60 cents with a 20% discount, I don't, pal. All right? Um, they don't ring at the moment and say, hey, do you want... It's like, so if you're a subsidiary of mine and you mis mismanage your cash and you ask me to bail you out, I'm going to want to bail you out at what I consider a fifth of intrinsic value at a 20% discount because that's how public markets work. So it's really a very rigorous mindset around the value of $1 of equity um, and then saying, well, where can we put it now? We don't need to, to have equity to make acquisitions, which is an incredibly privileged situation. We've got particular banking arrangements that we've built over 15 years so that we can basically buy 
a new business with no equity down. We structure so that the people that are buying it are guaranteeing the debt, and we don't take any money out of that business until that debt's paid down. Now, I never share that particularly publicly in any depth, as I haven't done that, um, but it means that we don't need to issue equity. We don't need to retain equity in order to buy what we want to buy. And importantly, Matthias, it means that when we're doing a deal, it'd be very easy to do more deals if we were just prepared to pay a lot more money and have sloppy terms. But because we're so capital constrained, which is how I started, I quite like it like that, we have to really think intelligently about how to structure and how to get a deal done using like the smell of an oily rag, like no equity is my mindset. I don't want to solve your business problem, your succession problem, when I'm buying your business with my equity, because let's face it, it's your problem. And there are 10,000 of you. So if you don't like the way I like to solve problems, which is in partnership with you, where you're, you're putting up some of the equity, I'm putting up all the expertise and the, the business, et cetera, um, then I'd rather talk to your mate and um, do that with him. So, you know, that's really important. Um, we love paying dividends um, because we think that if you invest in the business, we should give you a return. We're not a tech company in that sense. We don't believe that if we raised a hundred billion tomorrow, that would necessarily, you know, improve our situation. We don't know that we can just buy the whole world or that we need to. It's sort of not a rush to grab market share like a, an Uber type scenario. So we don't think that mindset's appropriate. Um, we aggressively reduce debt and, and when we've got spare, cash will buy shares back. So at the moment, we've got some properties in the, in the head code that I'm trying to move out. That'll free up another probably million bucks. What will we do with that? We'll think about that, but you know, in all likelihood, we'll buy some shares or reduce some debt. So all I can say is that I, I, you know, I, I don't have parents who are gonna bail me out if I don't do things properly. I don't have any sort of sugar daddy or sugar mummy that's gonna help me if I get this wrong. Um, so I've just been very attentive to to the money and yeah. you know um great question people. um if if i may ask the um so i i, I get all that um and i think it's probably a, a, a quite a challenge to find the right balance between you know uh, growth and between you're doing it in a way that is sustainable and that is long term um, right. There has been, I think, uh, a few years back, there has been the case of uh, uh, Stockford, right? They, they've done it too fast, and I don't know the specifics of it, but I think they've basically just showed up very quickly and then eventually went bankrupt. Now, that's one data point and one extreme. Um, on the other side, you know, you can also grow too slowly, given the opportunity and given the, the playbook that you have, right? You talk a lot about the systems. That sounds to me that is scalable. How do you find that this 10% growth that you communicate is the right one and, and not more, not less? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking it's probably question. more because of the recent of the recent history, but talk to us about how you think about that and how you know that that's the right growth base. Yeah, so it's built up from the ground up. So if you go to a chartered account and say you have to grow at 5%, if you grow at 1% less, there's trouble. Um, but I don't want you to grow at 10 or 20 or 30. The rest of that's up to you. So we have young partners that want to grow at 20% a year. We've got older partners running big books at 5% is hard, a hard number to grow at. So it's like, what could every partner of 54 partners do? They can all grow at 5% and they must grow at 5%. So that, that to us is the organic piece. And then I've said, okay, well, if we do 5% um, by acquisition, that's sustainable forever. So my mindset is, if I say we can grow at 10%, I'm saying to myself, can we do that forever? Now, when you look today, you think, oh, 10% is not very good. But if you get your spreadsheet out, you do 10% forever. 10% forever is pretty good. That's, um, pretty, that's an aid that's asleep, Brett. You will own the economy. That's right. Exactly. So my mindset is when I went to the public markets, I identified what went wrong with listed companies. And we made a list, what we call a shit list. All the shit things people did, right? Don't do these things. Because mostly, you know, if, if you say, Matthias, are you married? I am, yes. Okay, so if I say, if Matthias says to me, okay, I'm married, how do I stay married? I'd say, I have no idea, Matthias, how to stay married. But I know how to get divorced. Okay, become a drunk, become a gambler, punch a wife, da-da-da. That's how you get divorced. 
So the way to stay married is at least this is this is manga, invert, don't do those things. So when we were listing, I was like, the number one mistake that I saw people make was over promise. Mm -hmm. They would say, here's my forward projections, 30% a year for three years. Here's my huge valuation. Now we had comparable companies at that time. They listed at 19 times. We listed at 10.9 times. That was so the founder could take a huge check up front. And so we have this list of, you know, founder behavior up front, take a big check, promise a big number. They don't deliver it. The founder loses his job. The um, company's share price is destroyed. Most of those companies that we listed with at the same time, when even in our year that we listed, they're trading at one third of what they listed at. I said, anyone that invests with me can't ever lose a dollar. I have to make commitments that are so conservative that we just cannot go backwards because the way to make money is to not lose money. So Buffett, one, don't lose money. Two, don't lose money. Three, don't lose money. So I say, I need long-term great shareholder partners. I've got to make sure they don't lose money. So I go out at 10.9 times, which cost me personally a fortune in the short term. But I thought the cost to me in the short term was much less than the upside to me in the long term. Now, the short term cost to me was about 20% or 30% of the company. So I owned 89% pre-IPO. So take 30%, I did a bit of pre-IPO and the IPO, say uh, the 30% should have been worth 8, 16, say 20 million. And maybe I, I got five or 6 million for that. So I put $15 million of my own money behind my ideas. Most people won't pay for their values. They talk about them, they won't pay for them. But I said, you know what? If I still have control of the company, that's John Malone from the outsiders, own more than 50%. And I can continue to prosecute my ideas for a long time. I believe that 15 million will be a drop in the ocean. Now, most people sell their reputation for 15 million. And there's a comparable business here that's in the real estate sector where I believe the founder sold his reputation for 30 million. Which in Australia, you get 30 million, you pay tax, you get 20 million, you know, you spend a bit of it, you got none left. So it doesn't didn't make sense to me to sell my reputation by over-promising. And I had all the bankers, their fees are dependent on size of the transaction, et cetera, saying, you know, we were going to raise 15 million. I cut back the IPO to 7.2. You know, the valuations that were talked about were much higher than the valuation I went out as. You know, they were like 13 to 14 or 18 to 19. I said, how about 10.9? Let's make sure no one who invests ever loses money. So I said, everyone who's on my chairman's list, I sent them an email the other day that if you put a dollar into the business at a dollar, you're going to go forward for a long, long time. Because to me, it's not business, it's all personal. So that's my mindset. So when I say five and five and then say, Everyone says to me, but hang on, you got a 32% CAGR for 15 years. What's this 10% business? I go, listen, I want to be somebody that does what I say. So it's much better to under-promise by a lot and over-deliver by a lot than over-promise and under-deliver. The markets are schizophrenic. So if you over-promise and you're just a little bit short, you'll get absolutely belted. Whereas if you under-promise and you're over-delivered even just by a little bit, over time, it will build up. So, you know, that's my mindset. And everything you've heard today, guys, it's five and five, what I call five and five. It's very conservative. I'm very aggressive about being very conservative, staying in my tiny circle of competence for a long time. Now, when I look at the numbers, if we can get to eight to 10 million NPAT, It'll trade at 25 to 30 times. Your market cap's 250 to 300. I still own half. That's okay. We can probably take that forward to somewhere near double that quite easily. I can see the market cap being between 500 and a billion dollars without having to reinvent the model, without having to put new technology in, without having to find a new product, a new market, without having to do anything other than what we're doing. Now, I sit with Lawrence Cunningham on a Zoom and he goes, Brad, Const, you know, Constellation Software, they've done 600 transactions, 26 years, 100 countries. Why wouldn't you do that? And I'm like, well, that's what we're doing. We'll just stay in our circle for a long time. Now, there's a risk of growing too slowly. I accept that. But frankly, if somebody took everything I showed them today and they came and they sat right next to me and they tried to do exactly the same thing, there have been people that have, have attempted that, they'd run into a few problems. 
you know, just because you can watch Roger Federer hit a forehand doesn't mean that you can take his 30 years of practice and somehow imbibe that, you know, through a one hour Zoom call. The stuff that we're talking about today, this is in my blood, in my bones, in 50 partners, deep, deep, deep in the business. And I believe the strength of that core is what will come out over time and it'll come out extremely strongly. Um, so that's, you know, that's, you know, build the core, go deep, keep going deep, keep building the core and the business will grow over time. You know, I, I'm more verbal than the average human. Um, so I believe I can express my ideas better than average. Um, and that has given us an opportunity to bring people to what we're doing, to align them to what we're doing for them to understand and deeply sort of get on board with our ideas. Um, you know, I think we've, we've named in our five-year plan that we're in an acceleration phase. I think people will be very surprised about the things that we can bring to the market over time because they'll look at me today in a tie and they'll think they understood what they saw. But we're very, very innovative. We're very thoughtful about what we're doing and we're very determined to build something really amazing. Brett, thank you so much. I'm looking at the time that was, as usual, much longer than we initially planned. So I kind of Sorry, planned for, for a, a longer one. Um, similarly to, um, you know, how you communicate, the, the risk, of course, is that there is then, you know, the second degree thinking of, ah, okay, he's under, under promising. So maybe there's more coming out of it. Maybe the best alternative would be to not guide at all right and that just the market figure it out but thank so you that's, so that's much. a plan yeah Matthias, yeah. that's the plan so i needed about 18 months ago a lot of people were giving us grief they're like what are you doing and i thought you know what i call it popcorn for moviegoers when you take the kids to the movies if you walk in and you're really determined you say no coke no popcorn we're here to watch the movie You're sitting in the seat and before the movie starts all the way through the previews, they say, I need some popcorn. I need some popcorn. Dad, I've got to have a popcorn. And you're like, you don't need popcorn. We're just here for the movie. Isn't it about the movie? Anyway, they wear you down. You say, here's the money. Go buy some popcorn. They sit there, they watch the movie and they love the movie, eating their popcorn, having their Coke. You see a movie without Coke and popcorn is not the same movie. And I, I realized that at some point you've got to throw some people some popcorn. You know, it's the same movie. It's exactly the same movie. But, you know, some people like popcorn. So we gave them this little five-year plan and we say, look, in case you can't look at 15 years that we publish consistently, you know, here's the last 15 years, in case you don't have the skill to sort of take that forward by some years, we'll do that for you gently, extremely conservatively, and we'll under-promise. And all of a sudden people are like, that's amazing. Do you really think you could do that? And I'm like, well, it's kind of just what we're doing. There's not really much more of it. But yeah, like, what do you think? We're kind of going to retire? Probably not about to retire. So that's what it is, guys. Like, it's, you know, I'll leave you, I'll leave you with one thought. We're, we're working on some technology within the business. You know, what would happen if we could build a marketplace of our clients where they could swap services and they'd be part of, they could get their tax on their app. They could swap services with each other. They could pay a SaaS-based fee to be part of our community. And they could actually get free accounting. In fact, they could get what we want to call profitable accounting. Where they're paying us a fee, but they get so many more referrals to their business out of our client base and the fees that they pay for us that there couldn't be any other community that they'd want to be part of. Because now of the really, Brett, Brett, now I'm really, Brett, now I'm really disappointed because now you're talking tech stuff. And I thought I, I was in old, boring death in Texas, which I love. <laughs> Correct. But that's where we are, right? We're basically, what's happening is in, in the economy, software development is becoming so cheap and ubiquitous that, for example, when I wanted to do a, a, a share scheme many years ago for our people, it was so complex, the law here, et cetera, et cetera, the structure, you could only give people some shares that they couldn't see and so it didn't really mean anything to them. Um, whereas now, you know, a company turns up, says, we got this software. I said, well, could we flip it like this and do it like this? They're like, yep. And they've done it for us. And now every one of our people are walking around in their phone. They're getting their shares. And the total cost for us to do that was about $20,000. So there's all of these sort of tech solutions that we can put together. And I guess my comment on that, Matthias, is we don't expect to spend any significant capital doing that. And the reason is that there's an amazing Harvard business um, case. I think it's called What is Strategy? It looks at the strategy of like very influential in our thinking on, on IKEA, 
and Southwest Airlines and these sorts of businesses. And what it shows, um, Porter argued that the, everything now can be duplicated within three minutes, sort of China photocopy nation, you just copy it. Um, but what you can't copy is activities uniquely um, put together in a unique comp combination to own a particular position in a client's mind. And so we believe that all of the innovation that's in our industry, we can access cheaply, but we believe that we understand our client better than anyone else. And we have a deeper relationship with them and that we can combine what we're doing in a unique way to build a very deep relationship you know, that, that is very, very enduring. Um, and we don't believe it's gonna take, we believe it's gonna take a lot of insight, but we don't believe it's gonna take much money. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, we believe that if you think about the number of client relationships that we have, it's like owning a huge swath of land where under there there's gold, that's accounting, there's silver, that's, that's tax, there's platinum, there's emeralds, there's all sorts of interesting things. And those clients increasingly want us to do things with them um, that add value, like help them sell their businesses, like help them do their wealth, their wholesale wealth management, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't expect that you'll see in our forecast, you know, other services are 5 million out of 80. We don't expect that we're going to change the focus of our services, but we do believe that we're going to be able to find ways to be paid for many of the things that we do at the moment that in our industry, you don't get paid for, mm. which is pretty exciting. So Excellent. Thank you so much. I, um, I, I think listening to you and imagining how it would be to work with you is a little bit like working with a coach. You know, there's a love and hate uh, relationship, I think. You know, love because I know that you're right and hate because you're probably also quite tough and disciplined about, you know, doing what we set out to do. So I think it's really inspiring and thank you so much. I saw a lot of people taking notes and, and there's a richness of, of wisdom and insights. Um, uh, so th thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope you guys had uh, really fun and it was um, a pleasure to, to listen to Brett. So uh, thanks for diving in. It's quite late now here in London. So it's early on, on your side. Brett, thank you very much. With that, I say goodbye, goodbye and um, Hopefully see you soon, perhaps one day in Sydney at your AGM. So um, that might be the uh, down under version of uh, the annual meeting in Omaha. So that's the plan, Matthias. It's really exciting. So the, the annual general meeting's coming up. Um, I've really enjoyed spending some time today, guys. I love London, absolutely love London. It's a pity I can't be there. And if anyone wants to know what I like to do in London, I like to go to Hayward Hill Books and uh, get the map of the antiquarian bookstores and follow them around and find uh, great old books. But um, on the AGM, we're planning a really exciting AGM this year um, uh, where we've got, uh, we've got some plans to, to put together, you know, virtually the, the, uh, the, southern, the southern hemisphere version of what uh, Berkshire does. And look, we are making a, a, a concerted effort globally to get in touch with people that are thoughtful about investing, have a value investors mindset, you know, to give you a sense of what I'm doing, like um, Cunningham's written a book on the, the shareholders of Warren um, Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, and I've written a letter to every single one of them. I'm sending them a couple of books and a, and a letter. So, you know, we're just trying to expand the quality of the people that we hang out with and the quality of the ideas that influence the business. And over time, we think that that'll continue to um, stand us in good stead. Thanks so much for your interest, guys. Hope it's been okay. helpful. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Take care. Have Good a great night, day. Everybody. Bye. Thank you.